Hello everybody and welcome back to another video of mine. My name is Zach and this is going to be an introduction to what is hopefully going to be something of a long-running series. Responding to a book that was put out by Bethel Church in Redding, California. Um, I wanted to start transitioning my channel uh, sort of from talking about the Word of Faith movement and the prosperity gospel to talking about um, some of some aspects of what is called the New Apostolic Reformation. I need to put together a video on that and sort of explaining what exactly it is, um, because it's sort of, it's very closely intertwined with the Word of Faith movement, but there are some differences as well. There's some resources and things like that that I need to review before we really dive into that, though. Um, but what I wanted to do is start providing a more thorough response to a book that was put out by Bethel a number of years ago called The Physics of Heaven. And this is a book that I wanted to respond to um, for a number of reasons. One is it is endorsed by the figureheads of Bethel, namely Chris Vallotton and um, Bill Johnson. So the, the book sort of has Bethel's stamp of approval on it. The other reason that I wanted to review this book is because, um, quite honestly, it's something of low-hanging fruit. Um, it is a theological train wreck. It's really easy to offer a pretty thorough response to many of the issues that are being brought up in the book. And the reason that I want to do this is because I want to demonstrate that um, for as big of a name as Bethel is, and really, if you go to just about any modern American evangelical church, you're probably going to be singing songs from Bethel during Sunday morning worship, at the very least. Um, Bethel is a big name in modern evangelicalism, and uh, they're actually really dangerous. Bethel is not a group that I think Christians should be utilizing for biblical resources of any sort. Um, and so I want to take the time to begin going through this book to offer a response to what Bethel teaches, and to offer a response to a book that, um, like I said, is endorsed by their leadership and is also sold in the bookstore of the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, uh, which is a school that you can go to and pay thousands of dollars to learn how to operate in the miraculous and do all sorts of signs and wonders and things like that. Um, that's a whole nother issue in and of itself. Uh, if you think you can pay money to receive signs and wonders, I would point you to Simon the Magician in the book of Acts. It did not go well for him. So, with all of that being said, uh, we're going to jump straight into the foreword here. Um, I attempted to go through and just, as I'm reading through this book, I highlight things that I think are worth responding to or things that are just blatantly wrong. Um, the problem is I end up highlighting a couple of things on every page. And so we're only going to be going through the foreword of the book in this video. Uh, in future videos, we will go through other chapters, obviously, and break them down and uh, just address it um, not quite in a line-by-line -line fashion. I don't think I can legally do that with copyright laws, but under fair use laws, I can go through and offer a response to some areas of the book. So um, the first thing that I want to point out is the very first chapter sort of sets up the whole tone for the book and um, why it ends up being pretty disastrous. And so this, once again, this is a foreword written by Chris Vallotton. And it says, In this powerful book, Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis assemble a team of seers who peer behind the curtain of creation to reveal the mysterious nature of our creator. This book reads like a journal that emerged from a Holy Spirit think tank where great spiritual leaders gathered to discuss their insights into the complexities of God. Through their creative intelligence, these seers have emerged with new perspectives never before pondered. And that's where we get to really, um, once again, the whole tone of the book, but I would say the first serious issue that we run into in this book. Um, anytime that somebody comes up with a new teaching in modern Christianity, for lack of a better term. Anytime that somebody says, oh, I don't think anybody has ever realized this before. This is a whole new insight. It is never before seen. Um, first of all, it's probably been seen before. We've got 2,000 years of church history to back us up. There's a lot of stuff that people are running around saying today that they believe is something totally new, 
and it's really uh, usually just a copy of some ancient heresy. So I'm, I'm extremely cautious, and I would urge any Christian to be extremely cautious when a group is running around saying they have whole new insights into God and the Bible. Um, I would say at this point, 2,000 years after the fact, uh, we have a pretty good understanding of what the Bible's saying. In fact, I, I would say that if you believe that you don't understand what the Bible's saying, or l- let me rephrase that, if you believe that the Bible is um, to some extent incomprehensible, that we can't possibly understand what it's saying, um, you're basically telling God that he doesn't know how to write a book, which is the way that um, Bethel as a whole and those in the fringe, uh, well, I would say the fringe of the charismatic movement, but this is more accurately a representation of the New Apostolic Reformation or the NAR. Uh, those that are caught up in that movement tend to treat the Bible like it's a mystical book full of mystical meanings that... Um, We're just doing our best to uncover it, but we really can't comprehend it all. We need some sort of direct revelation from God in order to know anything. Um, So, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm struck by the very first paragraph of this book where it's like, oh, yeah, these are new perspectives never before pondered. Okay, in the event that they are totally new, they're probably wrong. We have 2,000 years of history behind us. In the event that they're not anything new, it's probably a copy of some old heresy, right? So, further down, um, uh, still on the first page, or at least on the the Kindle version, I don't know how it displays um, in the actual, how it displays, how it looks in the actual book or anything. Uh, But on the Kindle version, we still have, uh, within my first page here, we have the first citation from Scripture. Uh, from this book, and it's a pretty good representation, as far as I've read, of how they treat the Bible in this book, and that is, uh, they don't handle it correctly at all. Um, So it says, the Apostle Paul went on to say the saints are to, and then we begin the quote, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Oh, we start a quote with dot, dot, dot. Bring to light, dot, dot, dot. The mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities and the heavenly places. And they said they're quoting from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9. I want us to take a look at what Ephesians actually says um, because it's really disturbing to me. Let's see if we can do this um, side by side for way of comparison. It's disturbing to me that they will so freely cut out sections of the text, um, which unfortunately is nothing new for this movement. Um, the, the NAR and Bethel in particular is not really big on handling the word of God correctly. Um, that's just, unfortunately, it's who they are. So we're going to go ahead and uh, follow the three rules of proper biblical interpretation, and that is context, context, and context. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, and then we will end reading some uh, a little bit after verse 9, which is where Bethel left off. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not to make known to the sons of men in other generations, or sorry, I I misread that, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Um, When Bethel mentions the mystery... I'll I'll just leave off there in a second. We'll we'll jump back into it. But when Bethel mentions the mystery there in the book, um, what they're essentially doing is hinting at the fact that these believers have prayed and they've received direct revelation from God that is some kind of new spiritual insight into uh, all of creation and how creation works together and how God has revealed himself through creation. And actually, they they pull that. um, I'll have to go over that verse as well. I didn't have it highlighted for some reason. Um, But the mystery they're talking about is essentially their book. Um, The mystery that we see revealed here in Ephesians is the gospel. 
the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Bethel were going to accurately represent this portion of the text, and in specific, accurately represent that word mystery, they would launch into an explanation of the gospel. The fact of the matter is, we don't really see an explanation of the gospel uh, anywhere in the book. There's one brief mention of a sort of watered-down variation of the gospel that's typical of the NAR, um, but there's nothing in-depth about our need for a savior, our deadness and sin, Christ's atoning death on the cross, you know, things like that. They're not big on theology. Anyways, continuing on in verse 7 here of Ephesians. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he had, or that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So once again, what Paul is writing about here is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus and what he did. The way that Bethel brings it about is by saying that uh, the mystery which was or which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the church, or through the church, I'm sorry. Bethel was essentially saying that their book is revealing the manifold wisdom of God. It's revealing the mystery of God. Once again, if it were going to do that, it would be talking about the gospel. Guess what it doesn't talk about? The gospel. So, um, I want to also point out, um, this one caught my attention and I didn't highlight it for some reason. Let's see if I can highlight it now. How does this work? There we go. Let's make it yellow. Let's make it blue. It'll stand out. This book is a foretaste of things to come, unearthing what the great Apostle Paul penned nearly 2,000 years ago. And then it begins quoting, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. What a profound revelation. Creation itself is like heavenly bread crumb, bread crumbs, strategically placed on the path of life to lead us into understanding the depths of God. The reason that Chris Vallotton is bringing this up is because the authors of this book are going to go ahead and start talking about different uh, scientific topics such as quantum physics, basically tie in a whole bunch of new age philosophy, and then claim that they've received a revelation from God that God has revealed himself through quantum physics, essentially, and so the very fabric of existence uh, points out a deeper knowledge of God, and we're going to read that there's going to be a great sound from heaven that's going to fundamentally change the world and all this other nonsense. Um, they're bringing in Romans chapter 1 in an attempt to say that God has revealed himself through his creation, and so we can understand the depths of God through creation. Now, I will give them partial credit here, because Romans 1 does tell us... Um, about something that is known within theological circles as general revelation. And that general revelation is the fact that God exists, the fact that he is holy, and the fact that we ought to honor him and worship him, and yet we rebel against him. That's what God reveals about himself through creation. This can specifically be found in uh, Romans 1.18 is the beginning. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Or sorry, I just skipped ahead. For although they knew God, they did, not, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. 
Um, if you want a more in-depth teaching on the book of Romans, check out some of the videos that I actually have uploaded, or I should say they're audio only, so it's a black screen, but I am teaching the book of Romans to our youth group right now, and we are going through and exegeting the text. So if you want an in-depth breakdown of that particular text, uh, be sure to check out that video. The bottom line is what Bethel is saying is that God has revealed himself in a wonderful way through his creation, and so we can know the depths of God through his creation. What Romans is telling us is that God has revealed himself through creation, and so we are all guilty of rebellion against him, and we need a savior. Very different application and very different um, sort of intention behind the text when you view it through Bethel's lens versus when you view it uh, through the lens through the lens of the biblical context. Moving on, or this video is going to take forever to actually get through. We get to another paragraph later on. And actually, let's let's read two paragraphs so we have a little bit more context, because as you can realize, I am big on context. The physics of heaven is not the final word on creation's revelation of God, nor is it a treasure map that leads to a specific truth that unlocks nature's secrets. It's more like a divine invitation to join these supernatural explorers who, like Columbus before them, refuse to believe what the world or refuse to believe that the world is flat. Leaving the safe haven of conventional thinking, they set sail in uncharted waters with a passion to discover new lands. Like highly skilled sailors, handpicked for a treacherous expedition, each of these authors masterfully record their personal insights, which leads to a beautiful collage of unfolding wisdom. Let's just go ahead and read the final paragraph here. If you are tired of being a settler, Existing on the shores of tradition and riskless living, this book is for you. But beware, because once you have or because once you get a taste of these authors' insights into light, sound, vibration, and quantum physics, and you discover how God has written his personal story into creation, you are destined to see the Almighty all around you. Like listening to surround sound while watching a great movie, this book will awaken nature's voice in you curing deafness that was predicated long ago by single-dimensional thinking. The whistle is blowing, and it's time to set sail into the great adventure. Won't you join us? Ah, oh, my. There, there's a number of issues just in that one section of the text. I'm going to try to keep this short, but as you can tell, uh, it takes a, takes a little bit of time to properly go through a book. Um, first of all, what I have highlighted there... Each of these authors masterfully record their personal insights. There is no biblical exegesis. In fact, if you know anything about Bethel or about the NAR as a movement, they tend to frown upon being a theologian. They, they tend to tell you that you have a religious spirit if you take the study of the Bible seriously. What this book is, are the, it's more or less philosophy more than it is theology. It is the personal musings of some people that believe that they have heard from God and received some sort of revelation into the depths of how the world actually works. It's a complete departure from the biblical understanding of the world. Um, it's a departure from the Bible as, you know, God's revealed word to us, and it's sitting in a room quietly and, whis and waiting for the Holy Spirit to whisper something in your ear so that you can understand more than any of us uh, stuffy theologians have ever actually bothered learning. That's the overall gist of this book, is it's all subjective. It's all feelings. It's all, well, here's what I believe God has revealed to me. That's not how we study God. Really, if you believe that you need to sit down and be quiet and wait for God to whisper something to you, you're fundamentally saying that you don't believe that the Bible is enough. And if you know anything about Bethel as a movement, they don't. They'll often say, we, we need to go off the map a little bit. We can't put God in a box. I got news for you guys. If this so-called box 
is what God has revealed about himself, to step outside of the bounds of it is damnable heresy. God has revealed himself very clearly. We have a whole book we can work through. I don't understand why you believe you need some sort of fresh revelation when you clearly haven't comprehended the revelation that God's given us in the first place. And that gets right into, like I said, that final paragraph. If you are tired of being a settler, existing on the shores of tradition and riskless living, this book is for you. Or what about that last line? This book will awaken nature's voice in you, curing deafness that was predicated long ago by single-dimensional thinking. The single-dimensional thinking that they're referring to here is proper biblical exegesis. Bethel does not believe that the Bible is enough. They really don't. As a church, as a movement, Bethel... Uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, they do not believe that the Bible is sufficient. And so you end up with theological train wrecks such as the physics of heaven. We can see, I mean, just from the introduction, how proper theology is completely being undermined, subjective personal experience is being raised up as some sort of an authoritative voice, and voila, here we are. So, um, I hope this has piqued your interest a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to be attempting to get videos out on a somewhat regular basis on this. Um, but be sure to stick around, hit the little subscribe button, and do all that fancy stuff so you get notified when I upload something new. And we will continue working through this book together to offer a, uh, a critique and a rebuttal and a response to uh, Bethel as a church, and uh, in particular their book, The Physics of Heaven. So thank you for watching. Have a great day.